How did I go from being a musician, knocking around local clubs with a small home studio to working on hit records and winning awards? Now, you might expect me to say something about networking or joining an organization or maybe there's some sort of music business hack that we're keeping all secret or some of the other crap you'll hear from the supposed experts online. But every story I've heard from the big artists I've worked with had nothing to do with any of that. They were all completely different and somewhat random. I'd never really thought much about the details about how I got to where I am until I did an interview with Rick Beato because he asked me about my history and I just didn't know how to explain it. I, um, you know, like at the time, I can't remember the names, um, you know. Since then, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and I can tell you it wasn't part of some master plan, but it was about what happened when I crossed roads with a guy skipping school, an air conditioner repairman, Rick and an overly eager artist manager, and how those four chance encounters ended up changing the course of my life. I got into music because I wanted to write songs and be a rock star. I had bands in high school and a little recording studio in my parents' basement. After that, I moved into my own place and I built a better studio where I could record my songs and I formed various bands to go out and perform my music. I paid my bills by painting houses, doing carpentry, and occasionally recording my friends' bands for some extra money. And for the next 10 years, it was write, record, work, perform, write, record, work, perform, write, record. But it just wasn't happening. After all that hard work, I wasn't making any progress. There were just too many things that almost happened, too many disappointments, and I was having a hard time getting my album done because I couldn't find anybody who was serious enough about music and the eight-year relationship I'd been in with this woman who also happened to be my main musical partner at the time. It was completely falling apart. I was so burnt out. I was so depressed. But little did I know, I was about to meet one of the most important people I was ever going to meet in my life. And it almost didn't happen. You see, I had this one last gig to do with my partner, and I wasn't going to do it because we were breaking up and it was going to be happening on our anniversary night, which was going to make it terrible. But I wanted to be professional, so I decided I would do the gig. And while we're playing, this guy walks in, and I can tell right off the bat, he's a guitar player. Because you know how it is when a guitar player walks into some place where somebody else is playing guitar, they just kind of stop, and they stare at you, and they check out everything that you're doing. And that's what this guy was doing, and it was making me pretty uncomfortable. After we got done playing, he comes up to me, and he tells me his name is Jeff Burdett. And that earlier, he'd been on his way to night school, but had suddenly had this urge to hear some live music. So he just kept on driving and went to the first place he could think of where he might hear some live music. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I invited him over to my place to play some guitars. The next week, he comes over, and we're playing guitars, and he tells me that he wanted to start interning at some studios, and he'd been calling every studio in town, and nobody would let him come over except for this one studio that happened to be near where I live and that I should go down there and meet this guy. And I was like, sure, let's go. So a few days later, I go to what was Tree Sound, the original Tree Sound in Norcross, Georgia, and I met Paul Diaz. Now today, Tree Sound is known as one of the premier recording studios in the country and the birthplace of countless hit songs. But back then, it was a much smaller studio. And Paul is a bit of a character himself. He was definitely a character back in those days, but he was also one of the coolest guys I'd ever met in my life. And after hearing some of the rough mixes of my unfinished album, he said, I could take my recordings to his studio, transfer them to his tape machines, and finish the album up there. I could take as long as I wanted, as long as there weren't other sessions going on. So I took him up on that offer. However, when there weren't other sessions going on, Paul was usually out camping, rock climbing, or doing whatever a wild man like Paul does when he's not in the recording studio. But he had given Jeff keys to the studio and said, y'all just go in there and start working. You'll be fine. And Jeff and I were like, sure, man. But it was a little daunting because it was a small fortune in vintage recording gear. We were kind of scared to even touch the stuff. And even though Paul had given Jeff some basic instructions on how to patch everything up, Jeff's got a bit of a kind of a a weird memory, shall we say, and we had no freaking idea what we were doing. But we kept working, we learned how the gear worked, we'd stay up all night and sometimes stay there for days on end. And after working for about a year or so, we finally got the record done. Paul pitched in the money to press the CDs and I finally got my record done. This would have never happened had I not gone and done that gig and Jeff hadn't just decided to skip school that night. Everybody worked really hard to push the record. We got some college airplay, got some reviews on the record, but it never really caught on. I was really broke and very depressed and spent a lot of time riding my motorcycle trying to figure out what I was gonna do next. But I eventually realized that the whole experience had 
taught me a lot. I was not the same person anymore. I had a lot of experience and knowledge about making records. I knew a lot more about the music business and it gave me the confidence that I could probably make some money as an engineer mixer and that I could take a lot of the stuff that I learned at Tree to my home studio and with a few improvements, I could probably go get some work. So I put some advertisements in the paper. I put flyers up in music stores and I've started to get some sessions and it was starting to look like, wow, maybe I can actually make money from my home studio. Not long after that, I get a call from a guy who had seen one of my studio ads in the newspaper. And it was kind of weird because he wasn't actually calling about booking studio time. He just wanted my opinion on what would be the best microphone for him to buy so he could record his voice in his home studio. And me wanting to be helpful, I went ahead and gave my opinion and we hung up. But a few days later, he called again, and he's just asking more musical stuff, and there were other things he talked about I didn't quite understand, and then he invites himself over to my studio, and <laughs> I was gonna, I, I almost said no, because he just seemed so strange and weird, but there was just something about him I thought, what the hell? And he shows up, and he's not what I expected, because I thought he was gonna be a singer-songwriter because he was asking about a microphone. Turns out, He's an air conditioner repairman who also happens to make hip hop beats. Not that I had any idea what a beat was and I barely knew what hip hop was. And when we walk inside, he's immediately like, oh, oh, you could, you could make a million dollars in here. But first you should paint these walls purple and put a Chinese lamp over here and put a more comfortable couch right here. Have you ever worked on rap music? It's about to blow up. It's gonna be huge. And I'm just thinking, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? What is he even talking about? I mean, at that time, pretty much everybody I was recording in the studio was either a local rock band or a singer-songwriter. And me, I was the guy who played mandolin and sang his strange songs about spirits and angels. But there was something about this guy and some of the things that he was saying and his confidence and insistence that I should be working on rap music and that he knew these guys named Little John and Bone Crusher and that I should be doing a compilation album with them and and other local Atlanta rappers that had other kind of interesting names. And I just remember thinking, well, they seem like interesting fellows. Now, before I finish telling that story, I've got to stop right here and tell this other story because it was happening at the same exact time. And it involves another unusual person that I unexpectedly met that changed my life forever. In the mid 90s, I started to record a lot more rock bands from around Atlanta. And through Paul Diaz, I met a band named Shrunken Head that wanted me to record them. A couple days before the recording session, the drummer, Alex, calls me up and says, hey, I've got this guitar player friend that's gonna come help out during the session. Is that cool with you? I was like, sure, man. So partway through the session, this guy comes walking in who gets introduced as Rick Beato. But he doesn't have a guitar and he just kind of comes and hangs out in the control room and he's really freaking intense. He's just got this kind of strange energy and he's not doing anything at first, but once the band starts playing, he starts giving them his opinion and advice and all that kind of thing. And it kind of really bugged me because I, at that point I was trying to get more into production and this guy's telling the band what to do and I'm just like, damn it, dude, like who the f is this guy? Like, this is my fucking studio, man. He didn't really know much about the technical process. He didn't know what the gear did, but... He knew about music and some of his suggestions were damn good. And from the conversations he was having with the band, I could tell this guy had done something. He, he was somebody and he was going to be somebody. And after that, I started getting phone calls from Rick, which is kind of funny because it was at the same time I was getting all these phone calls from Chris Vermillion. The phone calls were very similar. They'd be asking questions about technical stuff and also wanting to bring work into the studio. And like Chris, Rick had a lot of ideas about what he thought I should be doing. But that's what creative and energetic people do. And suddenly I found myself surrounded by people like that. And over on the rap side, Chris finally talked me into doing this compilation rap record, which brought in Little John, Bone, Crusher, his group The Lyrical Giants, and a lot of other rappers and producers who later on ended up being key players in the Atlanta rap and hip hop scene. And this is the album we made. I never really made any money from this thing, but I'll tell you what, everybody in Atlanta heard this and said, who is this guy Billy Hume? And Rick was bringing in band after band after band, and I was learning so much about music and the music business. And all of this led to about 15 years of continuous work, but not Rick because he needed somebody that could engineer for him full time, and I had a bunch of other stuff going on, but I did get my first plaque working with him. It's crazy to think about how all the records I worked on and all the people I met and all the things I learned and all the adventures I had never would have happened except for meeting a guy who was skipping school and an air conditioner repairman.
but nothing lasts forever. The music business changed. I changed. My life changed. And it was time to move on. I just didn't know, you know, where, how it was going to happen. I just knew it was time for something random to happen. I'd gone to Memphis to speak at a recording academy event, and later that night, I'd gone to a bar to just try to relax. I was tired. At some point, this guy comes just bounding up to me, and he's like, Hi, my name's Michael Allenby. I'm an artist manager. I represent Al Capone, who is a legendary rapper in Memphis, and I'd like you to meet him. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to actually not do any more rap music. I think I'd, I'd done enough. And I'm kind of skeptical of managers as it is, but he had kind of a cool energy, so I was like, Sure. And he brings back Al, and right off the bat, I'm thinking, like, I like this guy. And it was interesting because it wasn't actually a regular rap project. Al does a lot of live music. He's bringing in great musicians, and I got to play on the records with some of them. And it kind of awakened something in me about how much I miss real music, like real musicians and classic music. And then one day, Michael tells me that he's managing this bluegrass group called the Infamous String Dusters, and would I be interested in producing them? Which I thought was kind of weird because I couldn't figure out why a guy who's managing a rap artist would be managing a bluegrass group and why he would be asking me because I don't know anything about bluegrass music and the previous two albums were done by the legendary Gary Pachosa who was renowned for doing this kind of music and had also recorded and mixed one of the best sounding acoustic records I've ever heard in my life. I've got to step into these shoes? Working on that first album was one of the most challenging, difficult, intense things I've ever done in my whole career. Because bluegrass is the most difficult type of music to record and mix well. I had to come up with new recording and mixing techniques, and the music is recorded live. Everybody's playing at the same time, so there's no room for mistakes. Not to mention, these are some of the best musicians around anywhere, so the level of professionalism where I had to be constantly was higher than I'd ever been in my life. I ended up doing three albums with the infamous String Dusters, one of which won us a Grammy. And that never would have happened had I left that bar and not hung out and talked to Michael and not agreed to do one more rap project. But for me, what was more important was what I learned from all the people that Michael introduced me to. All of them had this different way of looking at the music business, which was they put their creation, their music, their art, and their lives ahead of the typical music business ass kissing, claw your way up sort of stuff. And it kind of brought me back to why I originally got into music, which was to be an artist, to be a creator and to make new things, which was like this big, huge circle that brought me right back to here. But how did it all happen? I mean, the chances of any of those things happening to another person are so unlikely that you'd say it has to be fate. But I caused it to happen by taking advantage of unlikely events because that's where you're gonna meet the person who could change your life as long as you're willing to go for the ride. So like shiny dances now.